you have to uh, to um, introduce Andrea uh, this year Hitivoy. Correct me yes. if it's okay. Uh, she's a professor at the Carnegie Mellon University at Pittsburgh, and uh, she had many books about pickers. Uh, she will speak about. Uh, uh, can. Well, yeah, actually, um, yeah, I'm no, sorry. I'll take it, it from here because I'm compelled by yeah. Professor Promer's okay. uh, presentation to make a change in my title, at least in my, my subtitle, okay. which is Recourse Theory of Temporality and Religious Discourse. I'll change it to Recourse Theory of Temporality and Religious Experience um, because I agree with you that it's hard to pinpoint religious discourse. Um, and as is usually the case, um, my presentation is part of a larger project, so I'm forced to leave out some uh, sections, and I'd be happy to elaborate later if, um, if necessary. I'm interested in Ricoeur's theory of temporality as it shaped his understanding of narrative, especially within the context of um, the emergence of narrative studies in the United States in the 1980s as a very broad interdisciplinary field that was still, at the time, driven, nevertheless, by um, narratology and the study of narrative and literary criticism. And it was very much dominated by the complete absence of, uh, of the temporal factor. And I think the main innovation that turned out to be very long-lasting, in my view, that Ricoeur brought to the study of narrative was uh, a thematization of temporality and a very nuanced and robust understanding of temporality in contrast to the dominant theories of the time, both in Europe, especially in France, but also in the United States, in the work of the French narratologists, um, and then also in the work of American narratologists like Gerald Prince and uh, Seymour Chapman um, with their predecessors in New Criticism. And I think the theory of, the theory of narrative that Ricoeur revamped radically through his uh, understanding of temporality um, added a cognitive and a moral dimension to narrative that um, is primarily responsible for the direction that narrative studies took afterwards. The attention to the temporal factor in Ricoeur's study of narrative, especially in time and narrative, um, must be understood in the broader context in which it occurred, a critique of structuralism. Throughout the work he produced in the 1970s and 1980s, Ricoeur tried to integrate a philosophy of language into hermeneutics, seeking a departure from a structuralist doctrine at pains to purge subjectivity from the study of language. The attempt was bold enough and its success far from guaranteed. As Francois Doss notes, hermeneutics was criticized as running counter to the critical and epistemological concerns of the period, presented as an anti-science, a kind of phrenology of symbols." End of quote. The main point of disagreement between Ricoeur and the supporters of structuralism concerns Ferdinand de Saussure's distinction between long et parole, a differentiation that lies at the very heart of the structuralist enterprise. While Saussure argued that parole is only an ephemeral and imperfect reflection of the abstract and more systematic level constituted by long, Ricoeur asserted the transcendence of language. For him, language is defined first and foremost by the intention to say something about something, to convey meaning. Like Emile Benveniste, Ricoeur saw language as inseparable from discourse, emphasizing that usage is what gives it substance, thus allowing words to have meaning. As a philosophy of language, structuralism was set up to ignore time because it emphasized instead permanence and promoted historical abstractions. According to Ricoeur, despite the fact that structuralism, especially via Saussure, distinguished between a synchronic and a diachronic dimension of language, the actual study of structuralism privileged the synchronic as the priority of the state of a language over its history. As Paul Hopper has argued, structuralism totalizes and detotalizes discourse by viewing texts retrospectively in terms of hierarchical components. As a method of analysis, structuralism rendered time invisible even when applied to the study of stories and narratology. The one place where time would uh, have to be recognized or where time becomes human, as Ricoeur would later put it in Time and Narrative. Narratology, which flourished in the 1960s as an effort to ground the study of narrative in scientific principles, made no conceptual room for temporality. As Thomas Pavel reminds us, um, one of the most famous approaches in narratology, the one belonging to Gremos, uh, looked at the narrative model and boldly aimed at grasping the atemporal essence of narrative meaning. 
by reducing narrative to surface level structural connections between events and octones, um, narratology deliberately avoided an in-depth look at the broader temporal context in which an event would occur or um, in which a character would act. It ignored, in this respect, one of the key aspects of the art of storytelling, as understood by many, among them Walter Benjamin, and which is the ultimate storytelling, the ultimate safeguard against the threat of death and eternity. And as recently as 2003, J. Hillis Miller pointed out that time still remains insufficiently theorized in literary theory, obviously ignoring um, or downright um, rejecting Rigor's contribution, precisely because in Hillis Miller's view, the intellectual tradition from which the term is inherited tend to render it into an abstraction that escapes direct representation. For Hillis Miller, Ricoeur's discussion of time in time and narrative constitutes strictly a logical investigation, one that focuses primarily on thematic representations of temporal experience in literature, taking the language of these representations more or less at face value. And it's clear to me that Hillis Miller <coughs> is talking primarily about volume two of time and narrative and ignores volume one and volume three. By contrast, Paul DeMond illustrates for Miller rhetorical investigations that tend to concern themselves with the means whereby figurative language of certain extreme and problematic sorts is used in literature to represent that unknowable thing, human temporality. Indeed, in time and narrative record was not concerned with how figurative language represents temporality. But Miller is mistaken in depicting him as taking the language of temporal representation at face value. On the contrary, his analysis of Augustine in volume one of Time and Narrative is deeply embedded in reflections on language use, on common verbal expression that captures our everyday experience of time. Always sensitive to the style of philosophical discourse, Ricoeur was uniquely drawn to the rhetoric of argumentation in Augustine's reflections on time in his Confessions. He commented repeatedly on the Augustinian rhetoric each time emphasizing the operatic nature of his reflections in a way that suggests more than mere analytical observation, a theoretically salient fascination with the insolvability of the dilemma in question. Rigor was interested in the rhetorical features of Augustine's meditation on time because his own approach to temporality is also fundamentally a rhetorical one concerned not so much with offering a definition of temporality as with coming to an understanding of how time becomes incorporated in language and communication. The main goal of recourse philosophy uh, in time and narrative is to think language in time and therefore to uh, think the unity of that very reality which Saussure had disjoined, the unity of language and speech. Um, his conception then, uh, his conception of narrative then, comes as drawn from the dialogue that he stages between the Augustinian Confessions and Aristotelian Poetics, um, uh, in typical record fashion, two texts that would otherwise have very little to say to each other. Um, which is a dialogue he centers on a concept of representation that brings together the world of lived experience, linguistic expression, and the impact of language on experience. And to this dialogue, he will later add in time and narrative a third interlocutor, equally unlikely, um, and that is Martin Heidegger. By reading Augustine in conjunction with Aristotle's theory of narrative, Rigor hoped to emphasize that the key dimension of experienced human time is discordance. When time is not taken into account in the study of narrative, which is what Aristotle does in his poetics, what we are left instead is a conceptual system that stresses coherence and concordance. Where time is thematized, as in, is the case for Augustine, we have a constant yearning for concordance stemming out of a sense of being overwhelmed by the threat of dispersal. Thus, for Ricoeur, each of these two approaches, Augustine's and uh, Augustine's and um, Aristotle's engenders the inverted image of the other. The Augustinian analysis gives a representation of time in which discordance never ceases to belie the desire for that concordance that forms the very essence of the animus. The Aristotelian analysis, on the other hand, establishes the dominance of concordance in the configuration of the plot. It is this inverse relationship between concordance and discordance that interests Ricoeur and that seems to him to constitute the major interest of confrontation between the confessions and the poetics. 
The focus on discordance in August, Augustine's discussion of time comes from the constant probing of the three components of time, past, present, and future, and their elusiveness and indeed recalcitrance to anyone who wishes to define time through recourse to them. In recourse words, quote, how can time exist if the past is no longer, if the future is not yet, and the present is not always? How can time be measured, one could add, and it is the question that concerned Augustine, if its constant elusiveness defies measurement. In volume three of Time and Narrative, Rigor connects Aristotle to an entire cosmological tradition according to which time surrounds us, envelops us, and dominates us without the soul having the power to produce it. Um, in this conception of time, if humans were subtracted from the world, the heavenly bodies would continue to travel their celestial round, and Aristotle approaches the problem of temporality by reducing it to a question of motion and space, the distance between celestial bodies. Time for him represents how long it takes these celestial bodies to move. By contrast, for Augustine, temporality presents a problem because it is approached by a human being struggling to understand it and to understand its paradox, as you remember the famous question in Book 11 of the Confessions. Time is an entity we measure, and yet also one so ineffable that to measure it seems impossible. The famous Augustinian solution to this paradox was to shift the discussion away from time and onto the subject who perceives it. Time, then, is measured not as an autonomous entity, but rather as a stretching of a soul in the Augustinian concept of distensio animi, which takes place in the processes of remembering, perceiving, and expecting. These three mental operations corresponding to the past, the present, and the future. Augustine moves away from anchoring time as a series of moments in the past, the present, and the future, and looks at them rather as qualities a quality of the past, a quality of the present, a quality of the future. As Ricoeur explains, this shift allows us, quote, to consider as existing not the past and the future as such, but the temporal qualities that can exist in the present without the things, um, without the things of which we speak when we recount them or predict them, still existing or already existing. By focusing on temporal qualities that can exist in the present, even as they are of things past and yet to come, Augustine can make the past and the future part of the present. In Ricoeur's terms, then, and I quote, by entrusting to memory the fate of things past and to expectation that of things to come, we can include memory and expectation in an extended and dialectical present, which itself is none of the terms rejected previously, neither the past nor the future, nor the point like present, nor even the passing of the present. And finally, this move allows Augustine to talk no longer about time per se, as about psychological faculties that make the experience of time possible. Ricoeur sees the significance of this transformation in the following quotation from Augustine, and this is a quotation that Ricoeur uh, gives. The present of past things is the memory, the present of pre present things is direct perception, and the present of future things is expectation. Thus, time becomes the activity of a mind engaged in recollecting, perceiving, and expecting. It is in my own mind, then, says Augustine, that I measure things. I use the term activity deliberately to stress an intense engagement in a particular task, because as Ricoeur points out, the defining aspect of the distensio animi is that re it refers to a mind at work, one that acts, that is, expects, attends, and remembers. Distensio is, according to Ricoeur, nothing other than the shift in the non-coincidence of the three modalities of action. But it is a shift operated by someone, an individual actively engaged in trying to understand his or her own experience. The shift pulls apart and parcels out an experience that is otherwise continuous and available to us all at once. For this reason, as Richard Kearney has noticed, Record tends to translate distensio animi in very dramatic terms, using phrases as tearing apart or bursting asunder. The centrifugal force of the soul's distensio is kept in balance by a centripetal force, which is intensio, the ability to concentrate on and pay attention, perhaps the narrative attentiveness that Fernando was talking about, to a particular perception, a recollection, or an expectation. Distensio marks the domain of discordance while intensio that of concordance. Because it is located in the mind, intensio can no longer be associated with the now of a particular perception or with a point-like present on which the mind can zoom in. Instead, intensio is a tripartite now, 
equally associable with the past and the future. Enrico writes, it is easy to rewrite each of the three temporal structures of action in terms of this threefold present. The present of the future, henceforth, that is, from now on, I commit myself to doing this tomorrow. The present of the past, now I intend to do that because I just realized that. The present of the present, now I am doing it because now I can do it. That human time is measurable is especially important for conceptualizing implotment, since to create a sequence of events requires a chronological perspective that can align one event before or after others. Augustine's struggle, then, is at heart a narrative concern, comparable to Aristotle's, even though so radically different in its conclusion. Rigor was intrigued by Aristotle's dismissal of temporality as a strategy to see order and sequence as a logical problem and to eliminate the chronological problem in favor of a strictly logical one. In Ricoeur's words, um, in his poetics, Arist in Aristotle's poetics, the logic of implotment discourages any consideration of time, even when it implies concepts such as beginning, middle, and end, or when it becomes involved in a discourse about the magnitude or the length of the plot. While the plot of a story can unfold for the duration of um, a hero's lifetime, a year, even one day, an Aristotelian conception of implodment leaves out the aspect of duration and treats all stretches of time, no matter how long or short, the same way, by reducing them to sequences of events logically following one another. To follow a story, according to Ricoeur, requires a practical understanding of an entire conceptual network of actions, goals, motives, intentions, and agents. Without such a practical understanding of what help, hostility, cooperation, conflict, success, failure, etc., mean, one cannot follow a story. This level constitutes, for Ricoeur, my niece is one. For example, to know that um, a married woman cannot engage in a romantic relationship with another man is what affords readers a practical understanding that is crucial to an entire literary tradition of stories of adultery and betrayal. At the same time, the stories that compose one's cultural repertoire shape and reshape this conceptual network. Failure and success get redefined by stories of unlikely winners or losers. Hostility can acquire a new meaning in a just war or in an invasion narrative and an adulteress can become a noble heroine. The ability of stories, once they have been received and understood by an audience, to refigure the practical field constitutes recourse my niece's three. In between the two levels lies the text, as the linguistic representation of a particular action of, of particular actions, agents, and events. The plot per se functions at the level of my niece's two, and it is only in the plot that action has a contour, a limit, and a magnitude. It is at the level of my niece's too that we perceive certain events as preceding or following others. In Ricoeur's words, what counts in a theory of my niece's is the way in which everyday praxis orders the present, the present of the future, the present of the past, and the present of the present in terms of one another. But how does our experience of time make such ordering possible in the stories that compose our cultural repertoire? Ricoeur complains that we don't get an answer from Aristotle. Um, he also doesn't think that we get an, an answer from Augustine because it's, he finds no, in his words, no pure phenomenology of time in Augustine and instead only a psychological thesis. Ricoeur remains uh, troubled by the lack of a properly phenomenological dimension in Augustine and for this reason turns to Heidegger and, uh, um, and the properly phenomenological originality of the Heideggerian analysis of time. Um, consists in a higher accusation of the levels of temporality, or rather of temporalization. And it is an originality due entirely to the anchorage and an ontology of care. Following Heidegger, Ricoeur distinguishes between a time that is mechanical and impersonal, the time displayed on a clock or entered in a log, and the time predicated on a keen awareness of the world and the others in it. It is the second form of temporality for which he uses the Heideggerian term within timeness that plays out in storytelling and that also structures the way we conceive of the social order. Following Heidegger, Ricoeur argues that our experience of time is determined by our preoccupation with particular needs, obligations, desires, hopes, or ambitions. It is because there is a time to do this, a right time and a wrong time that we reckon with time, he says. 
A day is not an abstract measure. It is a magnitude which corresponds to our concern and to the world into which we are thrown. The time it measures is that in which it is time to do something, tight to, where now means now that it is, time, it is the time of labors and days. Um, Ricoeur's recourse to the Aristotelian conception of implotment would suggest that the fundamental concern of the Augustinian reflection of time on time, which is a Christian meditation on eternity, remains bracketed in Ricoeur's time and narrative. But although the problem of eternity is deferred to the end of the analysis, Ricoeur never loses sight of the fact that the Augustinian meditation is indivisibly concerned with eternity in time. Tuned into the rhetoric of the Augustinian text, he pays special attention to the genre and setting of the confessions, an address to God, which is an appeal to an interlocutor who exists on a different ontological scale, and yet is brought into relationship with the supplicant mind through an intimate rhetoric reflected in the use of the second person. Time is the very consequence of this rhetorical act of beseeching God as it is in light of the infinite perfection of this divine other spoken to in the second person by a first person that we sense our temporal existence. But once experienced throughout a confrontation with the divine, temporality becomes negativity, a lack or defect in being. God is infinite, human beings are finite and transient. For us, time is aging, decay, and death. And this is a much more marked understanding of discordance. For God, time is eternity. It requires struggle to find a reconciliation so that the contrast between eternity and time not be limited to surrounding our experience with time with negativity. He proposed a way of articulating the contrast between eternity and time in terms of the dialectic of intensio and distensio. Again, so after the Heideggerian detour, he returns to Augustine. In stretching our mind to remember the past, perceive the present, and anticipate the future, we also live out our limited time on earth. But in concentrating on the moment, which for Augustine is the moment of addressing God, we evade temporality. Once again, Richard Kearney explains, and I quote, in spite of the fact that we find ourselves torn asunder in our creaturely existence, deprived of the stillness of the eternal present and laid waste by distractions, we are still capable of seeking after the intentio of the inner self when united with its maker. Intentio thus defined is hope, evading the vicissitudes of time, what Ricoeur calls the sorrow of the finite. As Kearney puts it, by anchoring the dialectic of distentio and intentio in the larger dialectic of time and eternity, Augustine had underscored the fact that it is in the very midst of our experience of temporal dispersal that our desire for some eschatological reconciliation emerges. As a framework for experiencing time in this more ordered, meaningful way, narrative becomes a strategy for self-discovery, as well as a way of coping with the lack of one's eternity with the knowledge of one's inevitable ending, death. In Living Up to Death, Ericko writes about dying as an event, as a passing, as an ending, as finishing. In one way, my dying tomorrow is, he says, on the same side as my being already dead tomorrow, on the side of the future perfect tense. To think of myself as one of these dying people is to imagine myself as the dying person I shall be for those who attend my dying. End of quote. Up to the last moment and into one's most terrifying anticipation of the end, living requires the ability to position ourselves narratively, in relation to a past and a future, and in relation to the other characters who inhabit our life stories. And uh, without have being able to elaborate on this now, I think it is, I think the meditation on eternity in time and narrative becomes what is later explored as um, the importance of l'approche, the way of relating to others. So then just to conclude very quickly, uh, time for record represents the structure of existence that reaches language and narrativity. The main conceptual tenets of this understanding emerge from his reading of Augustine, but are also influenced by Heidegger and Aristotle. Following Augustine, Ricoeur believes that our experience of time unfolds at the limit of negativity. But in response to the phenomenon of negativity, Ricoeur argues that we experience time as preoccupation with the events and actions marked as significant by our cultural repertoire. 
Time then is reducible neither to measurement nor to logical sequences before, now, after, but re reflects instead on ontological care, understood as a way of making sense of our experiences, knowing what counts as urgent, belated, timely, or untimely. Ricoeur's conception of time is the product of an original hermeneutic method that involves reading thinkers against each other by reading them against, scholar, against philosophers uh, who have a very different conceptual system. This affords an understanding of time that recognizes the existence of a gap between the reflecting mind and the world of experience, and that looks at language as the bridge. Ricoeur says it best, and I will end with this quote. Because we are in the world and are affected by situations, we try to orient ourselves in them by means of understanding. We have something to say, an experience to bring to language and to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the questions. We have uh, five minutes, uh, well, something like five minutes for the questions. So. Toward the end, about hope that's uh, involving escaping the visit to the mm -hmm. time. Can you relate that to what you're trying to bring me back into? So, what if hope is trying to escape the, uh, the losses, the dangers, uh, the damage of time, then your final point in terms of can, what, what's the full narrative of hope is the escape? Mm -hmm. Well, the part that I left out is a part that deals with <coughs> what scholars like Frank Kermode and Peter Brooks have referred to as um, our interest in stories and in reading narratives as a way of rehearsing death, because we know that a story will end, and the notion of closure in the story is our constant way of preparing ourselves for the notion of closure in our own lives. And yet somehow we continue to read these stories, even though we know that at some point they will come to an end. So the, the principle of hope, um, which I have yet to look more carefully into, is this drive that we bring to the experience itself putting on hold the fact that it's it's limited and it's finite. But I was really inspired by Fernando's talk to think more about um, the principle of hope as being also what you do with these narratives, not just the fact that um, narrative is what gives structure to time, but the fact that time thus structured is time better lived, better spent. You know, It's just a way of uh, enjoying your situatedness in time as opposed to suffering from your situatedness in time. It's a better life. Yes? Um, I have a question that's similar to um, the one I posed to Fernando and Metaphibia, so it's, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate, and it's not because I'm trying to be critical, but it's because these are questions that often get posed to me uh, by Belizeans. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't claim to understand Belizean philosophy, but I've encountered Belizeans enough to get a sense of why they don't, they tend not to like liquor on um, mm. his hermeneutics on self and time. And part, one of the criticisms um, sort of goes like this, that um, Ricoeur is limited in his, in his thoughts on time because he's, one, he's, he has a linear conception despite how much variation he has between the, the, three, the three tenses, as it were. And therefore, he also has to presuppose uh, a notion of the self which is traditional in terms of substance that remains constant. And for Deleuzian, that is bad because it uh, prohibits or hinders creativity mm -hmm. and um, the relations with virtual. And so the, well, often in Deleuze's philosophy, there is this desire to want to break from all things that might t tie the self down mm -hmm. to some kind of hierarchical organization or some kind of determinism. Mm -hmm. So there is this move to say, right, let's have a different conception of time. I can't tell you what that conception of time is because I don't understand the Liz well enough to do so, but given that general characterization, what would your response to that, that kind of criticism be? Yeah, I, I, thank you. I appreciate the question. Um, I mean, my understanding of Deleuze on time would be that he's got this concept of the fold that deliberately tries to avoid the, the linearity. And I, I actually do agree that Ricoeur, to me, st still seems very much 
Aristotelian in his understanding of time. And in an essay on narrative time that was part of a conference at Chicago in 1980, he talks about, um, he introduces the concept of the followability of a story, which is very much a way of pro uh, projecting forward and uh, and remembering retrospectively by a way of making sense of the story. And it is very much on a linear plane. So I don't think, I can't defend Ricoeur because I don't, I don't think he is defensible on that level. Now, the implications of that, on the other hand, that it actually um, precludes creativity, uh, that to me does not follow logically, unless you assume that creativity has to be a form of uh, radical break and it has to be revolutionary and um, you know anarchical to some extent and of course there is that direction as well but um, to me that's more of a claim rather than a kind of logical implication and I think if you look at if you if you somehow did a survey of creativity in politics or in poetry you would be hard pressed to to argue that creativity only exists in moments of rupture it's it's it doesn't um, you know it's definitely it exists also in what Ricoeur calls the sedimented universe of discourse. So that would be a, as far as I would go to respond to a Deleuzian critique. Thanks. Questions? We can, we have time for one question more. <laughs> Someone. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.